lucky enough to have uh, uh, two uh, two gentlemen that, that have joined us for our, our panelist dis discussion here. Um, and who we have is uh, Mike Trust, uh, who uh, you all probably are familiar with from uh, uh, the different involvements he's had in the past with CITPG. Uh, Mike's uh, formal uh, his formal training with uh, in Middle Eastern languages, history, and culture. Um, but he changed over to the computer world and uh, self-taught uh, computer engineer who had designed both uh, hardware and software systems as well as managed uh, uh, enterprise IT shops. Uh, he's a specialist when it comes to uh, telephone, fiber optics, internet, and satellite industries. And Oh, okay, all right. We've got uh, Mr. Ed Wilson, also known as the scripting guy, is uh, uh, being uh, gracious enough to uh, also uh, help us out with uh, tonight's presentation. And I'll give a little bit of history on, on Ed as well here in just a minute. Uh, but I, I can attest to the fact that Mike is uh, an industry expert. Um, I've actually tapped him for his knowledge uh, quite a few times as I, I work in telecommunications as a sales engineer. And uh, he definitely has, uh, he's an innovative thinker and uh, doesn't go about things in a, the normal way, I guess you'd say. He, he, he looks outside of the box, however cliche that, that phrase is. Uh, he, he definitely uh, follows suit with that, um, and, and he has years of experience and knowledge that uh, uh, he'll shed upon tonight when uh, going over um, some of the items we'll be discussing. Uh, he, he headed off uh, advanced project teams for several high-tech uh, consulting companies, uh, and uh, Mike was also invited to uh, be a participant in the uh, Clinton-Gore Next Generation Internet uh, Initiative. He also is uh, presented at many different industry seminars, uh, telco trade associations, uh, to the FCC, and international uh, PTTs. Uh, he, he claims to be semi-retired, but uh, again, he, he's still quite active when it comes to uh, VoIP industry um, here in Charlotte as well as uh, around the world. Uh, I know our, our company's kind of, I've talked to a few folks and uh, hopefully we will tap into his knowledge and and uh, think of some innovative ways to uh, deliver some VoIP solutions. Um, Mike uh, was actually the one that came up with this idea of doing this panelist discussion, and uh, it sounded like a, a great thing. What we're really looking for tonight, too, is a lot of involvement and interaction between the group. So uh, if you have some different, uh, not only questions, but even if you uh, uh, have, have some ideas or thoughts on a subject, please share it with the group. Um, don't be shy with this meeting. Definitely uh, uh, be vocal with your thoughts and opinions. And uh, for those of you that may not be advanced Linux or Microsoft uh, gurus or users, uh, don't be shy here. Kind of uh, present some questions of things you may have thought about but just didn't know the answer to. This, this isn't just for uh, uh, some of those advanced type questions. We're also looking to entertain um, solutions to everyday problems you might be uh, uh, faced with. Uh, who, uh, Mike has also um, been able to to rally up here to uh, uh, be on the panel and uh, is uh, Tim Whitaker. And Tim's here sitting in the center. And uh, uh, Tim, uh, uh, he, he jumped in the ISP scene in 1996. And from there, he's been working to, uh, with uh, various companies all over the world, including the Library of Congress, eBay, and Sega in Japan. Uh, Tim is both a developer and network engineer and has been part of uh, many integration projects involving various system uh, methodology, methodologies. Uh, so it'll be interesting to hear Tim's perspective and uh, has definitely worked for a vast array of some uh, interesting uh, uh, former employers and companies. And then who uh, just uh, weren't expecting but glad that he's joined in the uh, uh, discussion here is Ed Wilson. Ed is. Uh, presented to CITPG before, uh, and it was very nice of uh, uh, his wife, and I'm sorry, also, uh, Mike's wife is here in, in attendance. Uh, thanks for allowing him to come out on Valentine's Day. <laughs> and uh, Ed Wilson's wife, Teresa, is also in the audience. And uh, we appreciate, again, you, you spending your time with us here today. Uh, my wife is not in the audience, but uh, appreciate those that did come out and realize that it is, it is a tough day to kind of uh, 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 
break away and, and attend an event like this, but we're, we're appreciative that we have such a great turnout uh, tonight. Um, with that being said, um, oh, I also just wanted to add to, uh, Ed Wilson also shared with us, but we, we've got quite a few giveaways um, this afternoon or this evening. Uh, he shared with us uh, several different books that uh, uh, we'll be sharing as uh, door prizes this evening. Uh, but wanted to mention, too, some of you may or may not be aware of the, the scripting games. It's, uh, it's a pretty neat uh, concept that they've come up with over at uh, www.scriptingguys.com. Uh, but they're having those in April. Uh, be sure to check out that website. Again, it's www.scriptingguys.com. Uh, if you've never been to the site before, it offers offer some uh, great tips, intuitive ideas, and uh, what they do is they have a uh, kind of a, they make a bit of a game out of it as far as uh, uh, scripting goes, and, and it's pretty fun, especially uh, for someone that may be a novice trying to kind of learn about scripting to those that, that uh, are advanced scripters as well. Um, and also want to make you aware of, uh, they have a PowerShell, PowerShell user group that, uh, uh, actually happens uh, here in Charlotte. Um, Ed's a part of that. They have their March meeting um, on the 19th, and that's actually on Microsoft's campus, but it's uh, anybody can, can uh, go, and that's in the AP1 building. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Microsoft campus before, but I've gotten confused several times when I was there for events, and they made me sign in one building to leave and go into another building that I signed into, so... That can be frustrating and confusing, so try to note that it is AP1 on March 19th. Uh, at what time is, is that user group? Oh. Or, Teresa, do you have? Okay. And I hope you all heard that. She did speak up, but it, w it was um, 6 p.m. in the building on the far left uh, when, you, when you come in uh, uh, through the entrance, in the far end of the building. But, uh, and again, that's March 19th, AP1 building. Um, and they're actually going to be doing some fun stuff there for that meeting. Uh, they're going to, uh, in the, at their March meeting, they're going to have a, uh, it's International PowerShell um, I guess, month? User group day. Okay. And uh, what they're going to be doing is having a live meeting with a, another user group in Phoenix. So it should be uh, interesting, exciting. And uh, for those that are interested in, in the shell scripting, uh, in particular PowerShell, uh, definitely make, a, make some time and go. Uh, you'll enjoy it. Um, with that being said, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, what I'd like to do, too, is... Uh, Partially through it, you'll probably see some just general ideas of, of topics that, that maybe would be of concern when it comes to really comparing um, the uh, Microsoft and Linux uh, environments. But um, uh, does anyone have any question that they want to kick it off with? Or uh, Nate, I'd like to kick it off. Okay. Um, again. Uh, the uh, representation here is not to prove which one is better than the other, but to show where each has its strengths and weaknesses. And it really depends a lot on your own applications, the size of your organization, your enterprise focus and applications. Now to give us a little heads up on your perspective, I want to ask a couple of questions and you all can add too. But how many of you work with what I call large enterprise systems? That is 100,000 users or more. Okay, that's a small, I mean, there's representation. Um, how many of you in your work history have uh, operated enterprises where you had 20, 30, 50 or more offices that you had to coordinate together? Okay, we get a few more that way. 
How many of you have been principally in local businesses with any number of employees from 10 on up? Okay, that gets the majority of the folks, or the largest number of the folks. Um, okay, so that'll kind of focus on some of the things. Um, my perspective, and I know Tim's and probably Ed's, is that we've worked with all sizes, uh, from very small. I happen to know Tim for 10 years, and we've just kind of walked right into the middle of the early part of becoming an IST. Um, I've done things with 175,000 desktops to support. That's a, that was a lot. I've done the scientific side of it as well as the other. So our first topic, uh, he said he was going to put up a slide here. We'll go with what's on our paper then and just invite your first questions and then we'll pass it among us. The first topic is we want to speak a little bit and answer some questions about um, how many of you use IIS versus how many of you use Apache or similar Linux-based? Uh... No. Oh, that's okay. Nate, Nate didn't give him any slides. Not to worry. <laughs> yeah, this is this is fine. All right, I'll read you some of the first topics, the uh, points under the IIS and Apache kinds of comparisons for large enterprise environments. Uh, some of the topics are single server performance for the two servers, uh, cluster performance for the two servers, and the, um, which one is best with doing a lot of little things versus which one is really best when doing hundreds of millions of things, rows or whatever. Uh, the other part about extensibility, integration, and add-ons. So I will introduce myself as having done Apache much more so than IIS. Um, Tim has done both extensively, and Ed, I assume you're more toward the IIS side of life. <laughs> Pick it up from here. Uh, I haven't done Apache uh, ever since I started working for Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise. Um, from, um, but a long time ago, and I don't even remember which, which version of Apache it was, uh, but um, I know that a long time ago when, uh, when you set up Apache, it was way, way, way faster than IIS was a long time ago. Uh, these people probably have a lot more experience with that. Uh, the difference, though, um, back then was that uh, setting up and configuring an IIS server was pretty much click, 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 and you're done. Uh, setting up and configuring an Apache server was not click, 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 and you're done. Uh, so it was, uh, was more complex. But like I said, it was way faster back then. Uh, nowadays, as I understand, you know, that, um, I don't know, I think uh, IIS is probably, you know, a lot faster. On the IIS side of things, you know, I know that uh, from a manageability perspective, from a scripting perspective, um, you know, we've got PowerShell commandlets, you know, for, for working with IIS and stuff, and, um, you know, so I like that aspect of it. Oh, I'm stuck between the Linux guy and the Microsoft guy. <laughs> um, it, in my experience, um, I, 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 I hate to sit on the fence on this. They're, they're actually both really great. It, it really depends on your application. Um, for example, if, if I'm going to do a pure uh, PHP type of application, then I'm going to go straight <coughs> Linux and Apache. Um, on the exact same hardware, from my experience, uh, Apache and on Linux will just do that better. Uh, and, and very specifically Apache on Linux. Apache on Windows, not that great. Um, on the flip side, um, of course, if you're going to run ASP or ASP.NET, anything like that, you, you have to run it on IIS. You don't have a choice. Um, from my experience, though, um, IIS actually is better in some of the more simpler things, such as image management. Uh, let's say you had... Uh, a website that supported a large number of images, for example, uh, like a social networking site or a forum, and people were able to upload images and you know things like that. IIS just does that better. Uh, it can deliver the content faster. 
than Apache can. Um, and, in fact, I think Apache kind of overthinks that a little bit. Um, in my experience, in order to get a Linux server to perform as well as a Windows server for just images itself, you have to use something else like uh, uh, in Nginx or Lighty. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with those or not, but those are just really small web server applications that do one thing really well, like image management. Um, Okay, uh, I see all the questions are bubbling up. I will uh, uh, take a few since uh, the slide will make it to the screen here eventually. Um, the, uh, some of the questions we had is, gentlemen, uh, if you had the, let's assume you had a large active e-commerce site. And in the large active e-commerce site, you had to run millions of hits. and. Uh, I've been in places where I've had to deal with 500 plus servers in uh, handling all those hits uh, on the front ends. Uh, and I personally have not been involved in the front end. I'm the back end guy uh, and the operating system guy and the database guy, but I haven't done much on the front ends. But if you had to choose one of these large e commerce sites with hundreds of front ends, uh, what has been your experience? If I had um, if I had something like that, um, I think that uh, it's, it's not specifically a feature of IIS, but it is a folk, uh, feature of um, IIS and uh, Windows. Uh, we have um, you know we do have uh, load balancing, um, and um, and so and the the load balancing actually would, would be something that would be pretty good for this type of application. Uh, because you know we can you know, we can get the hits that are coming in, and um, and then we can send them back back and forth. One of the things, that, at least in the Windows world, that gets a little confusing, you know, is that sometimes you know we have a number of different technologies, all of which sound alike. Uh, so you know, load balance is also sometimes referred to as clustering. Um, I grew up in the Vax world. You know where we really had clusters, and so in my mind, I don't see that as clustering at all. Uh, what I see as clustering is clustering, you know, which is where you have um, two different servers or more, um, and each uh, one is passive, one is active, one's on the line, and the other's ready to pick up the load. Uh, we also now have active-active cluster where we've got another machine that's doing something else, and neither one of them are fully loaded so that they can share the load to something else. A failover might also be something that you would be interested in if you've got an e-commerce site, but I would think primarily the first thing that you want to look at is uh, going to be the, the load balancing so that you can bring the stuff coming in. And that's part of the OS. Um, it's not, it does a really good job, particularly in 2008 R2. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of 2K8 um, Experience. I'm 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 still a 2K3 kind of guy. Um. <laughs> well, I mean, I, if 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 I was setting it up from scratch and if I didn't have access to hardware load balancing, then I would definitely use Microsoft's load balancer um, because it it does what exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, if I had a hardware lo load balancer though that could handle the traffic for me, then then I would do Linux. Um, it, it, it'll be more to set up, it'll be more work, but the difference would be um, I would spend money on the hardware for the load balancer, but I could have less Linux servers to actually do the work. And the reason for that is, uh, depending on the size of the site, I, I typically make it so that um, I know my servers can handle the load in the sense of I can lose a machine or two and still be fine. Um, whereas the Microsoft way is more of you kind of have a hot spare waiting to jump in if it needs to. A am I? Well, that's, that's one way. Yeah. Um, so again, I mean, the, depending on the size of the, the site, and, and I don't know what the limitations are on the, uh, the built-in load balancer for Microsoft. I, I've never reached it personally, um, but I, do, I have used it and I do like it. Um, so again, that's a, it's clearly situational. Um, 
questions in that? Well, Linux doesn't have a built-in load balancer, but incredibly a number of the hardware load balancers are run with a Linux OS buried inside them to handle TCP flow and stack manipulations. So from that perspective, uh, Linux is represented, but it's external to the OS that you're running your application of Apache or web server on. And I concur. I've seen hundreds, like 30 or 40 machines coming through a single load balancer, uh, each of which is carrying a couple hundred to a couple thousand simultaneous uh, connections. And when it comes to hardware load balancing in those very large farms of servers, that really kind of takes away the difference. You don't have to depend on the OS to do it. It allows the, uh, the uh, application itself and the OS itself to keep the application running and not get involved so much. So from my side of the table, I haven't used the Microsoft load balancer, but I have used the exclusively hardware load balancers. Um, but uh, I look at the market and I look at, uh, I look at the large um, <coughs> The large sites like Yahoo, who's uh, almost exclusively Linux and Apache. I look at the trade statistics for the uh, Netcraft studies that says how many uh, servers in the field are growing. And the server population stats developed independently are 62% of all web servers in the world are running Apache. And uh, the IIS picks in at 18, 18 and a half, maybe 20 percent over the years. It varies. So, from a from a usage perspective, the broad majority tend to start with that one or stay with that one longer uh, for whatever reason. But there's still millions and millions and millions of both of them out there. This is my question, and, and this is this is. I don't think there's really an answer to this question or not, but I mean, when, when I hear a statistic like that, I have to wonder, and this isn't a slam against Microsoft at all. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pro Microsoft, but Apache's free, Linux is free. So, I mean, they own so much of the market in terms of web servers because there's so many startups out there that can afford to throw a Linux box together and get it up on the net as opposed to, you know, buying a Microsoft license. Unless you buy the hardware, you know, it, it comes with it or, or whatnot. Well, how many of y'all chose it unless it was free? Do we have any Apache users in the in the audience or yeah? I see what you mean. Okay. All right, let's uh one of the things there for a startup though that, that I would kind of be and I've run into this in, in different scenarios before where uh, it may be free and such, but how, the combat of, let's say, you don't really have the support staff in-house. Right. Um, Microsoft it seems like they can really hold your hand through the process if you do need that. Um, and there is kind of the robust nature of, there, there are quite a few folks out there that you can. It seems like there's, there's a lot more Microsoft gurus out there in today's world than, than the Linux gurus. Um, and it would be way easier, I'm sorry, it, it would be way easier to get a website up and going on a Windows box than it would be on a Linux box. I mean, there's no doubt about that. You, you get what you pay for between, you know, pay, paying for an operating system and getting a free operating system. I mean, out of the box, you're, you're up and running. And that kind of leads actually to a, another question that I had, and then if some other folks want to jump in as well, but... Uh, one of the things I know you, that we do have on the slide there is it talks about e-commerce. Um, a little bit of devil's advocate here, though, but also to kind of follow suit with that, um, some of the decision makers out there in different companies, organizations may feel a little bit more comfortable with the fact that you know, Microsoft is backing their e-commerce uh, uh, product, whereas in the Linux environment, if something were to go wrong, who is there to point a finger at, or who, how do you have any type of uh, uh, fallback mechanism or, or someone to reach out to to kind of cover you uh, if, if disaster does strike with your e-commerce? Do you want me to answer that, or who wants to? Can kind of just take take shots at it as, as you like. 
Well, first of all, if you're um, depending on the size of your e-commerce site, um, if you're an extremely large uh, e-commerce site, then you're probably going to have a co uh, contract with Microsoft, a premier contract. And if you have a premier contract, then you also have, um, have access to uh, Microsoft Premier Field Engineers. Um, and so what happens there is, you know, your server's down, and if we cannot get it back up, you know, via the phone in a certain period of time, we will actually dispatch an engineer to your site who will walk into your server room and fix it for you. And if he can't fix it, he picks up the phone and calls the developer who wrote the code and has him fix it. Um, I have been with very large organizations who were running massive servers from Sun when they were still selling Sun large servers. Uh, I have been seen, I watched them convert from one to the other from a lot of Sun work, uh, workstation levels all the way up to large servers and then they converted corporately over to all Microsoft and uh, I concur. They had the money to pay for it. I mean, you don't run 170,000 desktops in your organization without having the necessary funds to have the necessary talent available in the premier. Um, I've started seven companies in my life so far, and uh, none of them had $100 million or even, well, one of them sold for $100 million, but that's another story. Um, the uh, startups, which I represent, I guess, uh, we tend to go with what's available and we put more money in our people. So you will have to find and try to educate and get some of your people trained in those areas. And I have been with very large organizations running large numbers of both Linux and uh, Apache as well as a handful of Windows and IIS. And those larger organizations, by virtue of hiring the right talent and bringing in the right people, seem to be able to serve their own men's and meet themselves uh, halfway. I can point to companies that I've consulted with here in the Charlotte, uh, Carolinas area, and uh, some very substantially large organizations are very comfortable without the, uh, the if you will, vendor support. But as you get later on in the process, beyond the Apache server, for which there are available commercial vendors who will support you, but none of them are as big as Microsoft. So I still think it comes down to where they got started. If you do start that way, you've got to remember to keep training your IT staff and bringing in those people who know what they're doing in that area or who are just, um, I would say, out of the box far enough like me, to uh, see it as a challenge and just go for it and give it a try. And the difference is that uh, level of funding then kind of disappears with popularity and there's some quite stellar startups that have gone in that direction with their own self-trained self self -trained people. Um, I've got a question. Who has supported with... Um, uh, We've already asked that question, so I'll move on to that. Any more questions about IIS versus Apache, Linux versus Microsoft on the area of web servicing? And, and I'll just, if someone didn't hear it in the audience, the question was presented of what are some good web tools uh, both on the Linux side and the Microsoft side uh, uh, that could be used? Um, quite frankly, uh, easily available, I mean, for free. I mean, what, what comes with Microsoft with IIS, like Perfmon and things like that, that y you can't beat it. Um, uh, log analysis and, and things like that built into the Microsoft and IIS, you, you, you can't beat that also. Uh, Apache has some built-in uh, statistical stuff. Um, actually, Dreamweaver will work on pretty much anything. Um, Dreamweaver will 
develop uh, both uh, PHP, um, Java, uh, ASP, ASP.NET, and basically all it needs is a way to connect to the web server uh, in, in a, via FTP or through a local network share or something like that. Uh, but Dreamweaver is actually smart enough to where if you tell it like, hey, uh, I have a PHP server and this is how you reach it when you're working on your PHP code, it, it'll actually make the dynamic content for you on the fly by connecting to the PHP server. Uh, this question, actually, I'm going to quote my wife, who is a very active web developer. She uh, develops sites for uh, Linux-based LAMP environment, and some of the she uses just about every tool that Adobe ever invented. She has both a Mac development station and a PC development station running Windows versus Mac OS. And, uh, you know, there are lots of tools out there, but they're third party. That's the whole point of Apache is that the tools are third party. And they assist you at all stages of the development of the concept of the site, the artwork, the videos. And she does video editing and things like that for her websites. And uh, there's the commercial projects, even like WordPress. It's available for either or. It doesn't really matter. It's a booster to your web development cycle more than it is a necessary aid or a necessary third-party tool to run the web server itself. From the Microsoft perspective, essentially there's two tools. Uh, the first, of course, is Visual Studio. Um, and you know, Visual Studio is I don't know, it's just a, it's a monster product. Uh, you can take a, a one-week class just learning how to use Visual Studio <laughs> before you begin programming. But yeah, it's an extremely uh, capable tool. Uh, you're also familiar, I'm sure, with uh, Silverlight, which is more of a technology. You can do a lot of Silverlight stuff from within Visual Studio. Uh, the more recent tool, uh, which I enjoy playing around uh, with, is there's an expression suite of tools. Uh, we, we actually bought the company a few years ago. And um, and it's really really neat stuff. Uh, there's, you know, depending on which version you have, there, it's a suite of at least a half dozen different tools. Uh, one of which does a very very good um, is a very good video editor, uh, play around configuration kind of a thing. Uh, there's some other that allows you to do you know 3D rendering, yeah, you know, and to you know make like dancing babies, you know, and mission critical stuff like that. So uh, so it's it's actually pretty cool. Okay, any more? Next question. All right. uh, we're going to do MySQL and Microsoft SQL? Sure. That's the next thing All right. Um, how many DBAs in the audience? Or, or you have to deal with a database of some sort, whether or not it's, it's access. Okay. If it's access or, you know, any, any Oracle people in the audience or anything like that? Oracle? We got an Oracle person. Um, <laughs> ad lib here. Um, being the jack of all trades sitting in the middle, I have used both. Um, and, and in my opinion, they both have their, their, their good and their bads. Um, one of the biggest systems I ever built uh, the biggest e-com system I ever built was on a Microsoft SQL system. And um, I actually picked that over MySQL at the time. That was in 2004 um, because I knew so much VB script and the way Microsoft SQL back then, uh, well, I'm sure it still does, uh, the, the scheduling that's built in, the management that's built in into Microsoft SQL made my life so easy for triggers and things like that so that I could just say, hey, every morning at 6 o'clock, I want you to do this for me. And if it does this, run this query. If it does this, run this query. Now, you could do the same thing in Linux and MySQL, but you would have to write a cron job and a script to go with that cron job and put all your logic in that. Whereas in the Microsoft SQL, um, it was more or less just, hey, create an event, talk to this table. If you get this, do this. If you get this, do this instead. And it would send me pages, it would send me updates, it would send me emails, it would let me know what was going on all the time. 
Um, that being said, those are the reasons I like it. Um, my sequel, though, it, it, it's, it's pretty lightweight. It's come a long way um, with federated tables and views. Um, things of that nature it has made my sequel more, more of what I would like to use as a developer. Who wants to? Well, in my 20-some uh, years as an IT pro, I've uh, done everything from DB2 and Fox Pro and Paradox and, you know, one dorky database that was called Personal Pearl that didn't have anything to do with Pearl. Um, but um, I really like SQL Server. And um, with each version of SQL Server, it just keeps getting better and better. Um, I um, Actually, I've got certifications on SQL Server, um, but recently, um, I mean, you know, SQL is just such a huge product nowadays. I mean, we have like a whole, you know, business intelligence suite, you know, uh, that's there and, um, you know, with a lot of workflow stuff and, um, you know, with data warehousing and stuff like that, you know, that, that, uh, that, that SQL Server does that's, uh, that's absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, our admin tools, you know, for SQL um, um, are great. Yeah, and uh, they allow you to work with you know, multiple instances of SQL Server on multiple servers, and you can create your own personal groupings you know, within this, uh, the, the SQL management tools that would allow you to perform a single action on a subset of your SQL servers. Um, and the neat thing about it, um, at least from my perspective, is that we've started giving SQL Server away. You know, so in my mind, there's absolutely no reason in the world to use MySQL anymore. I mean, cost isn't an issue, you know, because we do have the personal edition of, um, of SQL Server. And, um, and even using the, uh, the personal edition of SQL Server, you can still get these, uh, these you know, world-class you know, SQL management tools to, to work with that. And you know, so I love it. Sure. Is it still, um, what was it, single proc, two gig limit? Yeah. <laughs> um, my perspective comes from a situation where I had to support 100 to 200 uh, databases serving the same information to two, three hundred front ends. The transaction base I had to deal with had row counts into 400 million and, and higher, not small. Uh, it required to accomplish between 15 and 30,000 hits or SQL transactions per second. And that per second adds up very, very responsibly. And the only way we could do that is by putting uh, all those front ends uh, cluster pointers, if you will, to back ends that had multiple MySQL servers to, to answer up the questions. And any one server would have a few hundred to a few thousand transactions per second, depending on what it was uh, taking on. So I was costing that at the time when it was free versus it was very expensive for the largest version. Um, hey, I made, the, uh, I made the startup's choice of picking the path of greatest performance for the dollar paid. And on that basis, uh, you know, I'm glad to know it's free. <laughs> um, but I have seen it do very respectable jobs. Now, I came up through, as Ed said, I came all the way back through uh, 402 accounting tabulating machines and doing wireboards. I've run with, you name it, uh, on the database, uh, not just uh, even before Oracle became Oracle. Uh, I was running Unify, uh, I was on VAX, and I, all the tools that were available on the VAX, uh, and all the tools that were available in uh, even the Sperry Unisys and the military computers. So. I came uh, up through a database the hard way, and uh, I actually had developed a heter heterogeneous database uh, distribution system back in the 70s. Uh, 
which, if I remember correctly, was before Larry Ellis got out of college. So I came with a, a very strong uh, architectural internals. And when I was faced with the challenge at the first of my many communications companies, telephone companies, and they were saying, hey, all the available tools on the switches are running in a Unix system 5 or earlier. Uh, when I was running for the military, we were running with various forms of BSD on the Vaxxon and uh, a whole lot of things. And the only databases available to us that were worth, of, worth their time were the SQL databases. So I came up through the SQL world. So when I was faced with this challenge, I did a shoot off Postgres at the time and MySQL at the time and uh, the uh, MS SQL. We had talent who knew all of them. We had plenty of people who were specialists and in love in one form or another. And we went through a series of very emotional, almost religious wars about which database is the best database. And uh, performance was our ultimate goal. And when you're dealing with 400 million rows, now we can put it in a partition table and put uh, 400 tables and put 100 million in each one, cut your uh, transaction time by a thousandth, practically. So there's a number of things that you can do to optimize it. Also, uh, what I don't call clustering failover. I call clustering simultaneous servicing. So I've put scripts, uh, I've put stuff together, some of which actually Tim had to inherit and run, pulled his hair out for a while until he got the hang of it, where we had one master taking all the updates from all the sources where anything was updated, and as many as 12, 15, or 20, sometimes 30 slaves that were actually handling those 30,000 transactions per second, give them a thousand apiece. Uh, so that's the background I come from. And if I had to do it again, and I asked Tim that same question, uh, uh, could you do it again using the large-scale Microsoft uh, uh, MS SQL? And the answer is probably now that you have the, uh, what I call the, the uh, 8R2 and cloud capabilities, there's a lot of things in the cloud capabilities that uh, when you start virtualizing it out and uh, you, you run the, uh, let me say, I have to even look up the name, Hyper-V, uh, there's a lot of press going around about when you move into the uh, VM environment and you start virtualizing and you start building in cloud systems. And those cloud systems are the kind that would hold the applications like I just described, where there's hundreds of millions of transactions going on every, every hour, uh, that I would think that there is something more in the cloud approach to distributing those transactions over a broad base. So I'm open to it, but my experience has been strictly with, you gotta do extremely large row counts and you gotta be extremely fast with a very large number of transactions Historically, everybody around me have all said they can't touch what we're doing with the uh, Linux Apache uh, slash MySQL and PHP, the full LAMP kind of environment. But again, that's been my experience. Tim has had both. Y'all got any questions, please ask them. Well, I clapped. I was in great applause mode when Sun uh, brought MySQL home, if you will, because the greatest performance element that was located in MySQL was the NODB database. And uh, MySQL actually got that as a contribution from Oracle. So when Sun and Oracle got together, it completed the, if you will, the, the heritage came back together and unified into one. And quite frankly, since Oracle has taken over, the Sun team has been allowed to continue uh, its development. And from uh, MySQL version 5.6 and following, the uh, performance on uh, Windows environments, and Windows servers, for example, improved 600% in standard benchmarks. So as Tim was saying earlier, it didn't work very well to run Apache and or MySQL with some Windows platforms. But since the unification, uh, they've played some serious 
uh, allegiance and homage to the original developers of the NODB. So now the transaction rates per second and the performance has gone through the ceiling and they have stated publicly their pledge to continue to allow the, the community editions of MySQL to continue to be available with all features without constraint and without restriction. So therefore, on that piece of it, for those startups like I was having to deal with low budgets, sounds pretty good future to me uh, because the performance has seen nothing but improvement since that team took over. On the other hand, the enterprise version of MySQL can cost you dearly. Uh, in one very large shop, they were paying close to $50,000 a year for the enterprise licensing and the enterprise tool suite and the enterprise support contract, fifty dollars to $60,000 a year. Um, just so happens that when I joined the organization, uh, after a year, we called them for their support and help two times in a year for that $50,000 <coughs> support contract. Our team had enough horsepower to do the research on the web to Google be their friend and find uh, other users who had done whatever it is that was causing them some grief. And many times those answers came out of Oracle employees, Sun employees, who were paid for it but uh, had given it out in some public forum or some meeting somewhere because they were all focused on making certain the community was well served. You can pay for it or you can get it from the community. It just takes a difference in training levels. So I'm very pleased with that change and transition. <coughs> Any other questions? That one was very MySQL history specific and I happen to have grown up with it. I remember when that happened and the first thing we all thought was, well, the original developers, they were going to fork it, right? They, they were going to fork the development of MySQL and it was going to be called something else. And we were all waiting for that transition to happen. And, and then when, when MySQL, MySQL actually started getting a little bit better and they didn't go down that route, we were like, wait a minute, this is actually something, uh, you know, we're, we're going to keep on this path. Um, and and I, I agree with Mike in the sense that, you know, you, you can get the community edition and, and it's free and you get what you pay for. Uh, if you have an e-commerce website that's making you know, thousands of dollars a day and, you know, something breaks and, and you need help to fix it, you're going to end up paying somebody. Um, the last one we were running with the MySQL was $70,000 an hour. Uh, well, with the, uh, with SQL Data Center Edition, I mean, we scale to absolutely enormous numbers. Uh, when I first came to work for uh, Microsoft, I had a... Um, I was a technical account manager and I was working with a customer uh, that was in the financial industry and uh, they were running uh, SQL Data Center Edition on a pair of clustered ES7000s um, against a SAN. Uh, they had over a terabyte of memory in those machines and um, they were basically doing analysis you know, for stock transactions, which um, I would imagine is a pretty decent throughput. What's next? Any more questions? Nate looks like he's moving. Well, I was just going uh, to... I just want to give one more question, then we can probably take a break. Uh, but a but, uh, question came to mind, I, I was kind of thinking when, when you all were talking, too. Uh, for users that maybe were using, uh, in, say, DB2, and are looking to transition to, say, MySQL or um, MS uh, SQL or Microsoft SQL, could you kind of explain as far as which one may be a little bit easier as far as transition or, or your opinions on which one would be easier for a transition in the database? My opinion is that in either case, there's third-party tools to help you with that process. Yep. Yeah, I've worked with uh, customers that were transitioning different databases, and yeah, you're going to need to get some third-party tools to do that. Um, even then, you're going to wind up uh, rewriting a lot of code. Um, and even... Yeah, and even if you didn't need to rewrite a lot of the code, you probably should rewrite a lot of the code because you want to take advantage of what, whether you go to MySQL or whether you go to Microsoft SQL, uh, you're still going to want to write the code in such a way that it takes advantage of the native capabilities of the database that you're targeting. 
And if you've got the amount of money that you're spending to move, you know, your database, you know, then go ahead and do it right. I have to give service to two people who came up during the break with a question. We're going to roll backwards a bit. Uh, we glossed over, because nobody asked us about it, security matters with respect to both uh, IIS uh, and Apache, and may as well comment about uh, SQL and MySQL at the same time. Yeah, I said, um, you know, when he mentioned, uh, mentioned about security, I said, yeah, I, I, I'll, help. I'll talk about that uh, because, you know, we're no longer embarrassed to talk about it. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, as far as security goes, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different things uh, that actually uh, come into the uh, mixture. Uh, number one is the number of vulnerabilities that are discovered and the patches, how quickly those patches get released. Uh, number two uh, comes into setting up and configuring. Uh, in the past, Microsoft got into a lot of trouble you know, because you would put the disk in and you would install it and everything was turned on. You know, and uh, with IIS, this was the same thing. You know, and uh, matter of fact, one of, you know, one of the favorite hacks um, a long time ago used to be to just use a search engine and look for like default.html. <laughs> then you could go and, you know, and then you could easily, obviously this was set up by an idiot, so it's easy to work your way into it. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so that's that's another thing, yeah. And um, our our mantra has been for you know, ever since Code Red, Nimda, you know, uh, those kinds of things really gave Microsoft a bloody nose. Um, and you know, Bill Gates decreed that we would do a security stand down. Ever since then, our mantra has been secure by default. And uh, so once you enable something, then you have to come back in and turn everything on. Um, yeah, at individually, you know. Don't turn everything on. Um, the the other thing uh, has to do with, and this is, uh, and we learned this lesson uh, from, you know, I forget which vulnerability it was, but it was a SQL vulnerability that really embarrassed us, um, and that is how easy is it to patch the machine? And that's when we started looking at SQL, and patching SQL was an out and out nightmare uh, to the point to which a lot of people simply weren't doing it. And um, since then, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, one of the really, really cool things for small and medium-sized businesses now you know, is the fact that you can have a server, you can configure it to do Microsoft Update, and it'll automatically put all the patches on it for you. And that also patches IIS um, and other applications as well. Once you get a little bit bigger than that, then we have you know, uh, Windows Software Update Services, which is a role that you can add to an internal server. And in fact, I run it at home. Um, and uh, it'll download all of the patches, even for SQL, even for Exchange, IAS, and all of those things. And it will deploy that to the machines. You can set it, uh, configure it however you want. You've got reporting and all of that. Uh, so you know, this is sto the story around security at Microsoft is a lot better than it used to be. <clears throat> this is just my personal experience. Um, I personally think Microsoft has a got a bad rap about security more on their desktop products than on their servers. Personally, I've had more Linux boxes broken into than Windows servers um, because an enterprising person can find some kind of loophole. I mean, I remember back in the 90s, I could attach to the SMTP port on a Linux box and email myself the password and hash it. And then, uh, you know, just log right into their box. Uh, Linux has had its own security vulnerabilities just like Microsoft has, and it's had its own growing pains. Um, IAS and Apache both individually, um, this might not be something you know about me now, Mike, but I, I'm actually kind of a SE Linux guy because um, used to be when SE Linux came out, I was like, no. <laughs> uh, and, and SE Linux is kind of a, um, a Linux bodyguard, basically, that, that limits. It, it can be the most annoying thing ever. It, it, can, it can be like Windows Vista or Windows 7 when you try to do anything. It's like, no, you know, you, you can't do that. Um, with SE Linux, it, it used to be my habit, and you know, I'm rolling out 12, 15 Linux servers, and I would just turn it off. Um, now, 
I use it a bit more because I can say, hey, you're Apache, and you're only allowed to do this. And the reason for that is if somebody does break in, they use, um, let's say, a WordPress exploit or you know whatever app that you're running on your web server, and they can get in. They're getting in as Apache. So now Apache can do things like run command line requests, make a SQL dump, you know, do things like that. But if you run something like SE Linux, it gets confined to only what it can do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I have to say that Microsoft stuff is a lot better in the sense of you install it, you have to turn everything on. I mean, it, it's locked down from the beginning. I came up through military security, and they laugh at both of those. Uh, no, but, you know, that's another story. Uh, I concur that permissions uh, in the SE Linux is the security enhanced Linux. That's what the SE part of it means. And it applies fundamentally a roll by roll by roll series of permissions. And every file in the machine is associated with a rule, a role, and a group of permissions that that program or the access list for a file or group of files. So in that sense, you can get pretty detailed in those, and that's why a lot of people, when they first saw it, the first thing you discover is that with uh, SE Linux enabled by default, tighter and uh, very tight, uh, it comes up and uh, you can't connect with uh, outgoing machines. You can't get a, a program that you install as a third party that doesn't have an SE Linux role permission assigned to it, can't even go out to a port. So you have to apply the favorite that you've run across, apply security exceptions, confirm security exceptions. But when you're running servers, there's no human there to see that. So you've got to have a little advanced planning if you're going to apply the uh, enhanced security. And I found that to be the same with uh, all of the military and uh, various uh, uh, government-related machines. Without the role-by-role -role assignment, you will not run a Linux machine in any kind of a serious security environment. But with it, you can uh, tighten it down as tight enough to pass uh, muster for very high security clearances. And I happen to be one of those guys who used to validate and break into those systems to prove whether they did or didn't have it. And uh, Carrie, my wife, was my security. She had top, top secret, and I had to report to her for everything on these weird trips I would take for doing these kinds of things. So. I agree. The security is something that has been improved on both sides, and it's continuously changing, and it all comes down to whether or not you want to clearly delineate roles that programmers and or programs or file systems are permitted and not permitted, and that's detail work. Okay, there was another one that came up. Uh, perhaps you want to ask that question right now. Would you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm an instructor at ITT Tech, and I have a lot of students here. And a lot of times, a lot of these students want to know what to study. Should I study Windows or should I study Linux? And I have courses on both sides. So which would, which ones would you suggest? Obviously, from both parties. We we all have uh, we we discuss this up here in advance, and I'm going to be the first guy to say, tell your students to study everything they can about anything technical, but to focus on their earliest jobs with Microsoft. Only because you took the uh, attendance uh, hand showing around here. How many shops are Microsoft oriented? And more than two thirds of the class stood up that way. So when you deal with it from uh, just simple sheer numbers, if your students are going to start in the small shop environment, it is dominated by Windows experience, Windows people. But if you're going after a specific industry, and I'll say petrochemical, telephone communications in the web uh, serious uh, large e-commerce shops, those are dominated by Linux. So, but they have their problems. Uh, one of the things, I don't have to train many people how to use Microsoft, but regardless of the seven companies I've helped start in the last 15 years, 
I have held constant training sessions for people to become familiar with Linux. I've taken people out of Boston College with a sociology degree and dropped them right in the middle of a very high-tech communications project to solve problems that other people didn't have a clue how to solve. I hired them because they were intuitive thinkers. They could think outside the box, they could develop algorithms, and they can express those algorithms to each other, communications-wise, human to human. And then I left it to, if you will, the code slingers, uh, sometimes affectionately known as code monkeys, to you know, throw the stuff together and see if it will work toward the algorithm. So it depends on what level you're going in, but I say, if you want to go for a frequent job opportunity, you'll find more Windows shops out there. But if you want to go to specialized industries, you better study up on the industry you want to go into and find out what they're doing. Yeah, I agree with that. The, uh, the other thing I would, uh, and I also agree, you know, learn everything you can uh, because you, you never know what you're going to wind up u uh, using later. Um, you know, interestingly enough, when I first got hired at Microsoft and I was talking to the different people, you know, over, over there at the office, um, I didn't find very many computer science graduates. I found, hist I, I found history majors. Um, I found one person that majored in classical languages <laughs> at Princeton. <laughs> uh, but, you know, journalism majors, lots and lots of music majors. Uh, so maybe if you want to get a job at Microsoft, you know, go learn how to play the drums. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it just it just all goes back and forth. Um, I was uh, I was also mentioning that I seen an article today that was talking about that a lot of companies are not deploying Linux as much as they would like, uh, simply for the fact that they can't find skilled people. That also because has a flip side of the coin for your students. You know that you know if they can find these opportunities and they have those specific skills. Uh, then you know they're going to they're going to make more money. Uh, in the Microsoft world, it seems that DBAs have a tendency to make more money than just uh, regular server admins. Um, so yeah, you know, there's lots of you know lots of those different types of positions. You know, but you know, learn everything you can. You know, that's uh, that's been my recommendation. I I don't know what to say. <laughs> um. I, I was fortunate. I, I got picked up at a young age um, to, to work at an ISP, like straight out of high school. I was going to college at the same time. Um, started not going to college because, you know, the Internet's down and there's 5,000 people mad, so, you know, uh, something's got to get fixed. So when you're, when you're working with Cisco and Livingston and, you know, things like that, um, it, it made school a bit different. I, I wish I had I'd tried harder to keep going. Um, a, after we sold that ISP, um, I, I felt like I, I didn't have the skills to actually go out and get a job. So the first thing I did is I went and got Microsoft certified. So I got an AMCSE that was a, that was for Windows 2000. Um, and the first job I got, I, I remember talking to the CTO after that, and and I just happened to mention that I, I was Microsoft certified. He was like, really? And I was like, yeah. Oh, I had no idea. Um, so I, I'm going to say the same thing as they did. I mean, you, you really need to learn as much as you can with all the technologies because you never know what job you're going to land or what interview you're going to do and, and find out. Because, I mean, I've been in interviews before where I've said, hey, I have no idea what you guys are doing, but I, I'm pretty sure I can figure it out and just more job experience from there. I'll give one final comment to the uh, employment uh, thing. I mentioned earlier that we had put at least three uh, job notices on there. The, uh, the, when they came through me, they were all requests for Linux people, and all three of them were placed within days. I have a question that kind of builds upon that. Uh, Microsoft, and I'm from an ISP environment where certifications had a lot of value, Cisco and different things, and Juniper, and it seems like everyone has a certification program now. 
Uh, Microsoft has, has a, a long-lasting certification program that has a definite value in the industry place, or in, in the industry. Uh, open source certifications are starting. You, you see a lot more of those uh, these days. Do they hold value um, in, actually, when you're looking for someone, too, that is, uh, say, for instance, a, a Linux guru, uh, how do you actually find that, uh, that personnel? Uh, how do you weed through someone that just says, okay, I'm applying for a job, you have Linux experience? Sure, I've got Linux experience. Tim and I will probably uh, answer this most strongly because we have hired people and had to evaluate them in various roles. And um, uh, I try to look more at the general problem solving and algorithm side, the personality issues. Uh, but uh, I could cite a gentleman that I know today who grew up with a solid IT experience, mostly in Microsoft. I did some initial training, got him familiar in Linux, and he went off to the Red Hat organization, got his Red Hat uh, certifications, and there are multiple levels of that. It's not easy to get that certification, but he did self-study uh, the hard way. We had him build about a hundred Linux machines. By the time he built a hundred of them and deployed them for different applications, he knew what he was doing. So nothing can teach you like doing it. And if you have a hundred machines and a hundred servers to go, that hands-on will teach you a lot. But building hands-on for installing the operating system doesn't prepare you for the IT role of IT management. IT judgment making and decision and trade-offs of different technologies at different times. It makes you a skilled technician. And the same thing about any of the certifications. So when I hire and I'm looking for uh, operations managers, I look for somebody with that broad background of experience. It's hard to hire a right out of school for operations management. But you can hire right out of school for operations, watch them and train them up through their skills until they become to that level. And it's called the school of hands-on hard knocks. And, but the Linux certifications and the third-party certifications are indeed increasing. I look at them as a plus, and a plus to me means that they have been tenacious. They have followed through, and that's part of the hiring decision. And uh, the other part of it is if they have shown some initiative and if they say, I loaded my own Linux Ubuntu, hey, that's enough to qualify you as far as I'm concerned. Uh, from, a, um, from an IT organizational perspective, um, I would recommend that your students uh, take a look at IT certifications. Um, those are, you know, you know, we've been emphasizing that at Microsoft for, I don't know, six or seven years at least, um, and it's definitely really, really good stuff. Um, there is also a, a CompTIA certification for Linux, you know, which is at a very minimal rudimentary level. You know, it's like an A-plus certification. Um, so that would at least you know, you know, let somebody know that they had a modicum you know, of Linux type of experience. Um, on the high end at Microsoft, um, two years ago, we introduced the Microsoft Certified Master Program. Uh, which is you know, kind of like an MCSE on steroids, if you will. Um, it has a, a very, very you know, you know, high-level um, you know, testing you know, and hands-on um, element to it uh, for, you know, for like Exchange and certain other programs like that. Um, all of those things are good. Um, at Microsoft, uh, we have a, a term uh, that we use uh, it's called Microsoft Smart, <laughs> uh, and uh, so a typical question during an interview you know, might be, you know, how do you learn a new operating system? You know, and if the person says, well, you know, I have to take classes and read the books, well, by the time a book is out on a Microsoft product, you know, we're halfway through developing the next product, you know, the next version. Uh, so, you know, we look for people that do get the hands-on, you know, that um, know how to think you know, intuitively. You know, they'll load a program, they'll play with it, and figure out how to use it. By the way, if you do take a Microsoft interview, 
That's the answer <laughs> that we're looking for. You know, you load it up, you play with it, you know, and try to figure it out yourself. Uh, what should you do to prepare for that? Well, first of all, uh, we do have, and I was going to mention this earlier, thank you for bringing it up, you know, we've got a, at least a dozen positions open in Charlotte. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is go to the Microsoft Careers website. Um, it might be Microsoft.com slash careers. I'm just guessing. Uh, but, you know, go through there, look and find out what positions are open. Uh, if you want to stay in Charlotte, then look for jobs in Charlotte. If you're like me, look for jobs in Hawaii. <laughs> Uh, we're getting to our uh, 8 o'clock time. I think we should, Nate, if you agree, let's uh, cut this off and st store these uh, topics for another session a couple of months out. Uh, and now that you all have uh, at least seen the kind of thing we want to do, uh, if you have some specialty and you want to get uh, that out in front of the people or you even want to just work up here as a presenter, please come right ahead. Nate? Okay, well, let's give a, a round of applause here for the gentleman who joined us as panelists.